Welcome everyone. For those of you in the room, we are getting for those of you in the room, we're getting ready to start our event tonight. And for those of you online, we're so glad that you joined us. And the, for those of you who will be watching us later, just know that you're part of the team. Um, this is one of the most exciting topics for me. Anytime we talk about Native Vote, I just get so enthusiastic because I've seen the power of Native Vote across the country. And we in Alaska have experienced what Native Vote can do for us time and time again. So one of the most important pieces about this particular election, and I, I want to hear myself, was what's different and how, what do we need to know when it comes to this election? So today the um, event is being sponsored and I want to thank those who are part of the coalition of the Southeast Unity Group Get Out the Vote team. And it comprises of a lot of Native organizations, Central Council, Sea Alaska, Clinton Haida Housing, Gold Belt, um, the list goes on and on of people who are involved, individuals as well as organizations to sponsor the, these, these type of events where we can become educated voters and make sure that every single Native vote and Alaskan vote counts. Tonight, we're pleased that we have three really um, outstanding guests with us who really understand and know not only from their individual work, whether they were a politician or whether they are um, influencing politicians um, or measuring success, um, we're excited to have the team that we have here today. So I'm just gonna introduce them real quick. Um, Bruce Botello is the board chair of Alaskans for Better Elections. And it's a nonpartisan statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving, um, to providing election and research on Alaska style elections. He has dedicated his career to public service, including three terms as Juno's mayor. We all know that, thank you so much. And as Alaska's attorney general, where I really got to get to know him. <laughs> and then we have Will, Muldoon with us. He's a data processor here in Juneau, Alaska and since 1996 and he currently serves on the Board of Education, CBJ Aquatics Board, Parks and Rec Advisory Committee, Disability Law Center and the Discipline Committee on Alaska Bar Association. He knows what community service is really all about and he's got the data behind it. So we're lucky to have him. And then we have Michelle Spark. It is a Director of Strategic Initiatives for the Get Out the Native Vote. Um, and she comes from Bethel. She has worked for the late Congressman Don Young and the Association of Village Council Presidents and several other Native organizations focusing on natural resources, healthcare, and more. But right now, she's leading the statewide Native, Get Out the Native Vote effort. So um, we're just so glad that she was able to fly down here and be with us today. So today, as we get started, we're gonna start with understanding what rank choice voting means. And what, and what, and um, so Bruce Botello, you're gonna lead us in, um, and let us know how the RCV works. I'd be delighted. Thanks so much, Jackie, for your comments. And I, again, I'm delighted to share the stage here with my two uh, distinguished panelists. Let me make sure first that um, we can get to the PowerPoint. So one of the most exciting things that happened uh, nearly two years ago was that Alaskans voted to make a change in how we elect our public officials. And it's generally gone under the rubric of uh, ranked choice voting. But in fact, we're actually talking about two changes that were made. And what I'm hoping to do during this presentation is to review that system, um, show how the ballots are counted, take a quick look at the ballot. We're going to uh, have a little opportunity for some interaction as well. You're going to be voting today. Um, for better or worse, it will not be any of the candidates that you will see on the November, November 8th ballot, however. We have uh, two elements to this new system. The first is in the primary, what we call the nonpartisan pick one primary. It largely explains itself, which is to say 
that from that ballot, you will select only one candidate. We'll get to that in a moment. And then the second element for the general election is ranked choice voting. So turning to the nonpartisan pick one primary, uh, what we know is that a majority of Alaskans do not affiliate with any party. And uh, as a consequence of that, um, part of this effort in terms of a nonpartisan ballot is to say that all candidates who are running for office, regardless of their party affiliation or whether they have one at all, will be on the same ballot. And that all voters, regardless of whether they have a party affiliation or not, have the right to exercise their franchise by voting for one candidate. So again, from here on out, and it started with our special primary election and our special general election, all state elections, this is to distinguish it from local government elections, will have primaries that are open and one is limited to one ballot. And finally, the point to be made here is that regardless of party affiliation, the top four vote getters are those whose names will appear on the ballot in the general election. So uh, again, this uh, reflects uh, on the left-hand side, the primary ballot that we saw uh, in August. One of the blessings, I think, that we saw as a result of uh, the open primary of this new system and the fact that, uh, in, at least in terms of the congressional race, for the first time in 49 years with the passing of Don Young, that there were dozens of people who wished to put their names forward as potential candidates to represent Alaska in Congress. And of course, the result of all that was to narrow that list to four candidates. One uh, then dropped out, and that led to our special general election and the election for the interim period of Mary Katola. But uh, we have tended to focus on the congressional election. We also had 18 candidates who were running for U.S. Senate and 11 candidates and uh, um, their respective lieutenant governors who put forward, forward their names to be our governor. And um, all of those, again, were narrowed down to four candidates, and they will appear on the November 8th ballot. Moving on. This brings us to ranked choice voting. And this uh, here is, uh, a, again, a, a sample ballot of what you're gonna be facing uh, on November 8th, and there are a couple messages to deliver here. First of all, um, there will be rank choicing with respect to the contested elections, but you will need to remember to turn your ballot over, because in addition to the selection of elected officials, you have two more duties. One will be to answer the question, shall there be a constitutional convention? That will be a yes or no. And also, under Alaska's constitution, judges must stand for retention, and depending on whether they are a Superior Court judge, a Court of Appeals judge, or a Supreme Court judge, a justice, they must appear on the ballot every seven to 10 years. And in Southeast Alaska, we will have several names appearing on the ballot. On the reverse side of the ballot, casting uh, for elected officials. So, in this particular uh, example, we decided not to go with uh, the names of specific candidates. You have your choice to pick your favorite natural wonder of the world, and uh, for those of you who are farther in the back may not be able to read it, but we have the Great Barrier Reef, Denali, the Grand Canyon, Niagara Falls, 
And in the general election ballot, you'll also have the opportunity to do write-in. So, um, as we go through this, we're, in this hypothetical, going to rank Denali as our first choice. And on our ballot, we get to move and make the decision about whether we want to cast a second, third, uh, or fourth choice. And in this case, we will move ahead, and we have now decided uh, that we're going to go for the Aurora Borealis as our write-in, as our number two choice. And continuing on, Niagara Falls makes the cut, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, and we finish off with the Grand Canyon. So uh, again, you have a chance to rank in each column your first, second, third, fourth, and in this case, fifth choice. If you mark the ballot this way, which is to say you mark one, Denali, and you mark it all the way across, you've only voted one ballot, and the only one that will count is your first choice. The rest of the ballot will not uh, make any difference. On the other hand, if you decide to mark your ballot this way, that is to mark everyone your first choice, your ballot will be invalidated. Because we can't decide, we're not in a position to decide who cast, how you cast your ballot in terms of your first choice. So we're going to uh, put you to work here. <laughs> if you have your cell phone, I'm going to ask you to use your camera and kind of focus in on this QR code. I'm going to try and do it myself. You're going to have a chance here. We're going to be voting for our favorite uh, <laughs> Uh, our, our favorite uh, Sour Patch Kid. And if you've had a chance to do that, you're going to have a chance in a moment to rank the choice. Your folks. Uh, question, yes, ma'am. What if we don't have that? Well, that's going to be a problem. Um, would you like to vote it? Uh, we also have, and you should have at your table, an opportunity to cast a vote as well. Unfortunately, this will not be as much of a secret ballot as those of you who will be using the uh, uh, QR code. And if you're successful with your QR code, you now have in front of you an opportunity to vote for either Linda Lyon, Oliver Orange, uh, Carrie Cherry, Rhonda Raspberry, or your write-in. Go ahead and rank your favorites. How many people uh, don't have uh, a cell phone and need to be doing a written ballot? Oh, we've got two or three folks. So, uh, David, will you be the election official that uh, <laughs> uh, gathers those ballots secretly? And in the meantime, Take, uh, take a moment and go ahead and rank your favorites. Now, if you don't know which one to vote for, you can examine them, cross-examine them, because you should, at each table, have several uh, um, of our, um, uh, our uh, Sour Patch kids. I'm going to rank right now. In fact, I'm going to have Michelle help me. <laughs> Okay, can I ask a question? Oops. So I'm going to ask a question because, so I'm going to show you mine, but it says, I went to submit and I had all of mine ranked like this, and then it says bad request. Well, we're going to have to figure okay. that out. Okay. Let me get that far along because I, okay. I, I'm uh, personally not also familiar with all these candidates, so I'm also going to turn to Will and ask him to help me vote. Okay. We are closing down on 
hours. I've now cast my votes, and I'm going to submit. Let's see if the same thing happens to me that happened to you, Jack. Okay. Mine says, thanks for my vote. Did you overvote, Jackie? <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. I'll redo it. Why don't we try that? Give you a moment. Has everyone else had a chance to cast their ballot? I'm about ready to go take a look at the pre preliminary results, but I want to make sure that Jackie is in the game. I'm, I'm doing it again. Jackie will make the difference. <laughs> Thanks for your vote. I was successful. Yay. So now we get preliminary outcome. This is what mine reports. It says that the winner, winner is Rhonda Raspberry. Votes to win, 112 of 223 votes. Now, uh, I don't know if that means we've got a lot of people online today. Right. <laughs> um, it's now, uh, it's actually showing me that she made it on the first round. Okay. Yep. Yes, a question. This book they were the um, physical book. Have we know what <laughs> Well, that, that's a good question. We, I now turn to my election official. Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> this could. The problem is that we won't be able to enter those results uh, here um, to make a difference, which will be the problem. Just preliminary. Well, we'll be glad to uh, to know what your collective those are. Was. Wouldn't those be considered kind of like absentee ballots that yeah. we would just count after? This is the preliminary vote. Right. <laughs> Change the result and they uh, actually filed on time. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you should, uh, it's actually rather surprising that we so quickly get uh, everyone in the, uh, we get the majority in the first round. Uh, what you would have seen in the normal course would be the adjustments that take place as we uh, end up eliminating the person having the least number of votes in order to get one person who would achieve a, a majority of 50 plus one. Um, so I'm gonna move on here just briefly. I think we'll have one other little item to look at in a moment. Uh, so can I ask a question about that? Sure. So you just said um, in order to get the majority of 50 plus one, that's exactly what the rule is going to be on this ballot. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So uh, if a person in the first round achieves 50% plus one, there's no need to move to the next round two or round three. That person is declared the winner. But if in the first round, no one achieves an absolute majority, 50% plus one, the person with the least number of votes is dropped away and those who chose that person their number two choice is then reallocated to the remaining folks until one achieves one candidate achieves 50 percent plus one and uh, um, in most cases we will move to at least a second round to achieve that in, in our in our election I'm just wondering if we can do that for our tribal elections. <laughs> just kidding. That, uh, I will say that uh, this method of ranked choice voting is one that is done in only one other state today, and that's Maine. But there are numerous uh, municipalities, local governments around the country that are making use of this model. Um, New York is just is the largest at this point, having just decided to do this uh, a year ago. San Francisco has been doing it for many years. There are roughly 25 local governments in Utah that have been using it for several years. 
And Australia has had this method in place since uh, 1902. So it's not exactly uh, uh, newfangled, but it is uh, a phenomenon that is very recent to uh, national politics in the US in terms of states. There are several states that are now, in part because of the experience of Alaska in Maine, uh, examining this very question. Mm. One of the questions that does come up is, do I need to rank everybody? And the answer is no. And in fact, many people in exercising their votes uh, in our last election chose to do uh, what is called bullet voting, or uh, where they cast a single uh, vote without trying to rank uh, their second and third choices. And that's allowed. You're allowed to rank only two or three as, as you would choose. One of the other questions that comes up, and um, uh, that comes up is, well, if I rank somebody number two, um, is that hurting my preferred candidate? And the answer here is no, because your first vote counts regardless, and you only move to number two if your preferred candidate is not, uh, is eliminated um, as having not had enough votes is at the bottom of the list. Why should I rank? Well, um, I can tell you there's a lot more debate about this particular question, and I would say that it's not a, uh, uh, any answer is the right answer. It depends on you. The message that we have is you have an opportunity with each ballot to make sure that as close as possible, the person that you feel most comfortable representing you is elected. And if it isn't your first choice, at least that you have a chance to express your view about the second most desirable candidate and so forth. But there is, again, no compulsion to do so. And, um, uh, we uh, at uh, Alaskans for Better Elections generally encourage people to, to exercise their right to use their full ballot. So we're going to take a quick look here at uh, something the Division of Elections has prepared to explain in more detail how votes are counted. Michelle. We have our own video that's coming up. I wonder if we should just skip to it. <coughs> uh, does not matter to me. I'd be glad to skip over if you, you have, have the same message. Yeah. Watch this. <laughs> Alaskans will use in ranked choice hear, voting in general elections got, for federal and state races. So we're going to go to the yeah, next. So we're going to skip this one and we're going to. Just a couple messages here. Um, that on election night, that is to say November 8th, we're only going to know the outcomes, and there'll be preliminary outcomes about first round results. It, you should expect, again, that there will be a delay of 15 days before you will know, absent the possibility that someone walks away with it on election night, what the final outcome is and how people apportion their votes. We have some deadlines coming, and we have some that uh, uh, have already occurred. Most importantly right now, if you want to um, do early voting, your uh, opportunity begins on October 24th. It's United Nations Day for those of you who may remember that from your school days. Uh, there's also a deadline for requesting an absentee ballot, which is October 29th. As you see, election day on the 8th of November and the final results uh, of the election on November 23rd. And uh, a quick recap, the primary ballot, vote one. Your general election ballot, you get to rank your choices. You will see four names to choose from, a maximum of four. There are many races around the state, legislative races, where there are fewer than four candidates. And I think I just said all this. So I'm gonna say thank you.
Thank you. So I, I, I know, Michelle, that you have some other things that you would like to speak to regarding this. So I'm going to turn to you next. Hello. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm Michelle Spark. I grew up in Bethel. Uh, I'm a member of my mother's uh, tribe in Chiba, the Kashini tribe. And I, uh, as Jackie said, you know, we were both preachers in Washington for a while. Um, I worked for Senator Stevens for a while, and I worked for uh, Congressman Young, um, who had been in office since I was born. So uh, he, he marked a lot of uh, big milestones in my life, and it was a shock. Yes, I, I knew this is how he wanted to go, but we all still weren't prepared for that. Um, the June 11th election, I'm sorry, I haven't went yet out the native vote. We are housed under Cook Inlet Tribal Council. You guys have known Get Out the Native Vote forever because everyone carried it on as a labor of love. So many of you have volunteered hours in your community or at AFN or First Alaskans with elders and youth or in uh, your, uh, your regional organizations. So we thank you for carrying this message all these years. Um, with, with the buttons, you know, the fun buttons, I'm thinking I vote, you know, and, and all those, all those regional um, tribal buttons are, are really fun to collect and share and display. Um, and the vote, I voted stickers too. So Get Out the Native Vote has been around forever. Uh, the Cook Inlet Tribal Council uh, assumed it from the uh, Anxa Regional Association a couple years ago. They decided they wanted a little bit more infrastructure behind it. So uh, I started in March, right when Mr. Young passed away, and then we had to get ready for the June, the special June primary uh, on June 11th. Um, that was a really hard build up, you know, just trying to get everyone to know that, uh, hey, get out the native vote is here, we're, we're here to be your partner, uh, we want to be here for you, we want you to be here for us, let's work together and make sure that, you know, our boots on the ground are getting our communities ready for three major elections coming up this year. June 11th was a little bit tough. It was an all mail-in ballot process. You all got a thick envelope from the Division of Elections. Maybe it just stayed on your kitchen table for a while. Maybe it made it to your uh, wood stack. I don't know. But, uh, you know, if, if you had gone into it, as, as Bruce described, we had an open primary system. That means it was a new gold rush. Anyone with $100 in a dream went to the Division of Elections and said, I'm going to be a candidate for U.S. Congress, and how neat is that? You know, b barring that you're not eligible, you could be on that ballot. So 54 people applied. 54 people thought, I can do what Don Young did for 49 years. <laughs> um, four people came to their census before the deadline. They withdrew. <laughs> but you still had 48 people on that June primary, uh, elect special primary. You only had to pick one out of that 48 people. This is the value of name recognition. So that's why candidates do campaigns. Or if they've been around forever, that's the advantage of incumbents. They can run on their name recognition. So a lot of voters are pretty passive. If they go down that list and they see a name they recognize, done. Maybe that's not an educated vote, but at least they're voting. What we're trying to get to in the Native community is let's do a little bit more education. Let's be a little bit more informed and make um, decisive and good and strategic decisions when it comes to electing people, especially when they're trying to represent our areas. You know, they may be running a statewide race. Maybe they always have a solid base, you know, in a certain, um, you know, partisan way. But with a, the moderating force of open primaries where we have all kinds of people running and it doesn't have to be dependent on party, this is exciting because they, want, they need to win with the majority, not a plurality. A lot of our politicians have won with very, very narrow wins, you know, under 40 percent, under 50 percent. Yep. That sounds like a lot, but it's not when you consider that they have to lead for all of us, not just their grades. So that's what the open primary system offers us. Unfortunately, again, you're still, we're gonna see a lot of people very gung-ho to see their name in print. They're gonna put their names in. It doesn't mean they have 
a campaign manager or a budget or they intend to fly around and you know campaign or anything but a lot of them will so that's it's kind of exhausting for you guys to have to get to know 48 candidates that's where you depend on local leadership you know uh, Lincoln Haida or uh, Sea Alaska um, any of your entities if you have trusted leadership they will probably do endorsements so talk amongst your neighbors and friends and family and and you can get a little bit of um, influence on, on how you choose to vote. Yes. I have a question. Um, I think Santa Claus was on that oh, list. Yes. Now, how does Santa Claus, I mean, was that a joke to the voting system? No. I mean, or is that just somebody trying to throw people off? Or how, was, how, did they, how does Santa Claus get on there? Santa Claus. Uh, was his legal name um, the candidate? Uh, he's from North Pole. He changed his name in 2006, so it, this was not a uh, Johnny Come Lately. He's also been a very active member, both of the city council in North Pole and during the course of the during the election period, was actually mayor of North Pole. So. Uh, one might say, uh, Santa Claus, that sounds like Mickey Mouse, but in fact, he was a real candidate. He had a platform. Um, he came actually, in Senate, right? Yeah, and he was a very eloquent speaker. Uh, it's a good question, I thank you for asking it, but. It was real. He was a yes. real person, he is a real person. Yes. Uh, so, okay, so the, the primary system is the, the easiest part of the whole process, is you just choose one. The division goes through and counts everything, and the top four vote getters move on to the general election. So we all had to vote in June. Summer hit, you have to compete with summer. It was a Saturday. Uh, there's a lot of things that went wrong with it, and it's not because it was by intention, but because of just the quirks of rural life and village life in Alaska. Uh, it's hard to compete with summer. A lot of people weren't going to sit down and study this, this election that we, we weren't really prepared for. So it was, it was not a great turnout, but it wasn't a bad turnout. It was actually comparable to 2020, I believe. So um, I just want to give you some stats, and then we can go on to the special election. Okay. But for June, uh, for June I, I broke down the districts, um, districts one through four, to let you know how your voting turnout was. Uh, and this is not a judgment. <laughs> I'm actually, again, I'm really happy with the turnouts we've had in two elections already this year. So um, House District 1, and that's Ketchikan, uh, Saxman, Metlakatla, Wrangell, um, you had a 22.14% voter turnout. There's 13,522 registered voters in HD1. Um, about under 3,000 people voted. That was how it looked in June. 3,000 people decided who was gonna go on the general election ballot in August. Um, so let me just give you an example. Saxman has 300 registered voters, 75 voted. That's a 25% voter turnout. Wrangell has uh, 1,965 registered voters, 506 voted. That's a 26.26% voter turnout. Um, House District 2, that's Sitka, Tenakee Springs, Heidelberg, Angoon, Pelican, Slash Elfin Cove, uh, Klawak, Cake, Kassan, Huna, Yucatat, Petersburg, Craig. That was a 37% voter turnout, so, so good on them. Uh, out of 11,500 regist registered voters, about 2,000 voted. Um, for example, Heidelberg has 282 voters, 41 voted. That's less than 15%. Um, Yakutat has 509 registered voters, 137 voted. That's 26.92%. So that's just to give you an idea. And that's, yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and can I can I ask the, if you're going to ask the question or make a comment, 
Um, raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you because we're okay. streaming this live. Okay. We want people to be able to hear. And if we don't, reiterate the question. Thank yes. you. We, we had a gentleman ask about the ANG uh, numbers and there's 308 registered voters, 83 voted. That's a 26.95% voter turnout. Okay. So the, the point of view, these kind of exercises, at least for Get Out the Need to Vote, is we want to do a deep dive into how our precincts operate we want to make sure we have enough recruitment with poll workers, translators. We want to make sure that our postal offices are, are well staffed and open. Um, we also um, just want to make sure that our voters, our people, our shareholders, our tribal members, we are all making plans to vote whenever the election season comes up. Now I know you guys do a lot of voting anyway. I know you vote for tribal council, you know, health corporation, uh, you know, housing, I know you have a lot of voting anyway, but when it comes to representation, we need to have our input. If we had an increase, if you all increased even by a few percentage, percentage points every election, you guys can really swing votes, not just in your region, but statewide races and federal races. It's really exciting about the potential we have. Um, you know, the last census has us at a 15% uh, Alaska Natives making up Alaska's demographic. Uh, if you add in 7% um, of the mixed, we're almost 22% of the state's um, demographic. If all of us voted regularly, we would have a quarter of the decisions in races in the state. And that's huge. That's a big deal. So, you know, it's your constitutional right to not vote. You don't have to vote if you don't want to but it's better if you do. You can't complain about things and the way things go and how policy is made or money is spent or dedicated to your area if you don't vote. So the June 11th, uh, I gave you an idea of what the turnout was in June. It was a little bit better, not much better in August, but uh, about 30,000 more Alaskans voted in August. So that was, that was, a, that was an improvement. We also didn't have as many ballots thrown out. Uh, maybe you guys read about the fact that the Mary Peltola's home district, we had almost two in 10 ballots thrown out on average because people made mistakes. Either they forgot to sign the ballot or they forgot to have a witness on there. Actually, but the second reason why most of these were rejected was because the ballots were stamped after June 11th. And that could be a postal service issue. So that's, there's a lawsuit on right now to, to challenge the results of June because we had such a bad rejection rate in rural Alaska, AKA Alaska Native communities. Um, the directions on the ballot were really technical, so maybe, maybe it was a, a translation issue. Um, so we're working with the Division of Elections, we're working with the Lieutenant Governor's Office, we're working with the United States Postal Service to make sure that we have a little bit more advanced notice about what their issues are when it comes to making sure you guys are set up for every election that's coming up. So, as, as we've said before, we're here for you, but you also make a difference for Get Out the Native Vote. If your community wants to get more engaged in voter education, you know, we're not here to tell you who to vote for. We're here to just tell you an election's coming up, make a plan to vote, vote by absentee, vote by fax, Vote by special needs representative. There's so many ways you can vote. Maybe you lose a little bit of privacy, you know, in other ways other than just going to the polling station and filling it out yourself. But there, there are ways that we can accommodate you if you forgot to register or you're going to vote by a provisional ballot. There's, there's never too many barriers unless you make it. If you make it successful, then yes, you're going to have your vote discounted in some manner. But if you make noise and if you insist, you know, there's always a way that we can get your votes counted. So the division does not have an obligation to make sure you have someone working in your community to vote. They can hire, they can recruit, but again, your local communities need to have people willing to staff. And wouldn't you rather have someone from home working your polling station than having us fly someone in? 
Um, so anyway, we're here for you. Uh, we're doing a lot of uh, a lot of studies and a lot of investigation into Alaska's voting behaviors, especially in our native communities. And we are working to make sure that we can ease the path for you to get to that polling station and again make your vote count in the end. So we're, we're very delighted to be here and um, it's a two-way street. Let's all help each other and we'll get out the native vote for November. Thank you. I, I mean, it's just amazing the work that is done uh, on trying to educate. I mean, a complex system, but something that's so important to our democracy. I just am very excited about the, the things that you've shared here today. I want to remind folks that are watching virtually that you can put your questions or comments in the chat. Um, and yeah, you can put them in the chat and we'll be taking questions and answers later. So I just wanted to make sure that you had that. Um, and then, uh, was there somebody that needed a, had a question here? Great. The issue, Dupier, Chief Bill, you gave us some data and that's good, but what I'd like to see is the data between adults and youth because these issues that we're dealing with is going to affect our youth and trying to get the youth to step forward because this guy, that, that doesn't mean nothing to me. I understand that. But it is the right to vote and, it's, and how do we get the youth to the tables and let alone the elders because the translation between what we did in the past to this ranking voting confused a whole lot of the elders. I for one, and then I had to work with my kids to try to get them to vote and try to explain to them what you're doing. And what you said earlier uh, is very important to me because if I decide to put one, if I want to vote for the Grand Canyon, and if I voted all the way across, I always thought that that was going to be uh, not counted. So that's a good thing to know because I can understand if you wrote everyone first. But if I just wanted one particular person that I voted for, like we did in the past, because you know, back then it was you had to vote for a Republican, a Democrat, or Independent. So now you can vote for who you think the person's going to do the best for the state of Alaska. But in doing that, there is a lot of translation. So this is very good what we're doing here to get the vote out. But with the data, we also need to know where do we need to concentrate on the youth? And does the youth got to do it? Like the, like the youth elder councils to bring, bring it to, to the votes? Because these issues that are happening in Alaska is going to affect the young ones when they get to be our age. And if they don't get involved now, uh, and how do we get them involved? So I was just listening to your data and I didn't hear nothing about the youth, uh, who's voting and who it is. Because even one, every one of our corporations, every one of our native deals, we get to vote out. We know how it works. Um, back when Lisa ran for independent, we all learned how to spell her name, <laughs> you know. And that was a real push. And we need to get the people to vote because there's lots of issues in the state of Alaska that needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. And to me, I look at who's going to take care of our veterans, uh, who's going to take care of my hunting rights, who's going to take care of everything that's going on. And the other thing that we need to really explore is option number one of opening up uh, the Constitution to see if it's going to, yeah. how is that going to affect a lot of us. I know it comes up every seven ten to ten years, years. Ten years. Okay. but that is an issue that could, could affect us all. Because a lot of folks come up from the lower 48 because they didn't like how it was going there. And now they're here in Alaska and they want to change it back how it was where they left. And I say that with our hunting rights. And I say that with the grounds that we hunt on for. Uh, our traditional foods, so so it's very important. So youth and elders and everyone needs to vote. I will act. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that question. I want to point out that I, I, I might embarrass him, but Kyle World, if you want to stand up or raise your hand, uh, Kyle is actually a member of our Get Out the Native Vote Board. So. 
when, when I was interviewing for the job, he actually gave me the toughest question and he asked me how we were gonna engage the youth. Um, actually, election workers can be as young as 16. So these are not even legal age voters, but they can work the polling stations uh, if we're having a deficit in the community. I reached out to a number of schools that, uh, that didn't have a polling station open in August. So we're, we're actually trying to plumb from high schools. Um, and if we can create a program, you know, with, with ASAG and, um, and, uh, or NYO or RIO or any outlet that has an inroads to the, to the schools, if we can get the youth excited and engaged and, and part of the, you know, engaged in civic duty, then this will help foster that culture where they realize how important the vote is. So that's one thing that, yeah, we're definitely working on. And actually the Division of Elections does break down voting by, by age, by, by sex, I believe, mm -hmm. all, all, kinds of, all kinds of ways. It's just a matter of, you know, who wants to do that deep dive? Are we gonna go in there and we're gonna, and I could literally go in and look at Ketchikan's precinct number one and see how many youth voted. Um, you know, with a mixed population like that, it'd be hard to determine how many of them were native. But, but there are ways we can do it. You know, it's just, it's a question of manpower, but that's, yeah, definitely, an, it's doable, and it's an ultimate goal is to have those kind of breakdowns too. Yeah. Well, when we're doing this kind of deal, it's also very important. Microphone. I don't know where, oh, uh, uh, sorry. I want to be able to make sure that we can hear everybody. Yes, like you said, it's very also important to, when you're addressing this, to address the youth with the gentleman right here to make sure that the issues that we deal with today, and I didn't know you can be 16. Um, and I knew when I was 16, I knew when I was 17. I could join the army and go to Vietnam, but I couldn't vote. But issues today will change that. So we, we need to work more with the youths too to, to get it across. So. I want to again. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take the comment over here, and then we're going to go to our next presenter, and then we have more time for conversation. Um, so, oh. um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to the panel. Thank you, uh, Sister Jackie Pita. Um, this is really important, and I'm glad that um, you guys um, had this information meeting uh, when I was voting. I you know, read through, it was a lot of information, and I thought I kind of had the gist of it, but to rehear it again, and for, you, for clarification, uh, for me, um, to make sure that my vote counts, uh, it's really important and vital. And um, I was also wondering um, if um, there, you said that you might need volunteers for the voting stations, um, if one is interested, where do you sign up locally? Thank you for that question. Uh, you can go to the Division of Elections. Uh, there's a form online that you can fill out or you can call them. There's, they have toll free numbers. Um, you can be a translator. You don't even have to work the polls. You could be, you know, work as a translator. You can work as an uh, election official or an absentee voting official. There's, there's different ways that you can contribute to your polling station on that day. And um, being a, for smaller communities, I can understand why uh, opening for two weeks for absentee um, opportunities can be you know, a little tiring for your tribal council or city council, whoever's operating the polling. But um, you know, for people who might not be able to vote on election day, it's good to have a plan again to know how you plan to vote so that you don't miss deadlines, so that you can actually um, either vote on election day or vote early. Um, if you're going through a hub, uh, like CITC, we're having an absentee voting station um, November one through four, and on the seventh, CITC is uh, near the Costco de Bar in Anchorage. So if people were coming through town, um, you know, you can come to a place like that and you can vote you know, with com comfort and confidence you know, that, that you're gonna be able to get the right direction on how to vote. We're not telling you who to vote for, but we are, we're happy to help you fill it up the right way so that, you know, it's gonna be read by the machine nicely or hand counted, you know, with officials. Mm -hmm. And I would just say that if you're in Juneau and you're interested in being a, uh, a worker, 
um, go to the fourth floor of the spam thing, uh, spam can. That is where the division of uh, elections is. So we're we're just a block, block and a half away. Or if you live in the valley, the regional office is located in the Mendenhall Mall mm -hmm. at the north end. And again, I'm sure they would receive you with open arms. Thank you, thank you. So now I'd like to turn to Will, who's going to tell us a little bit about how to run. But I think, and, and anything else that you want to add to this conversation, Will? Yeah, I'm probably going to lean into a little bit on the uh, everything else versus just the how to run. So yeah. I, I'm probably known to a lot of you guys as the guy who won the 13-day writing campaign last fall. The first person in Juno in 29 years to be there. Thank you. Let's see if I get applause for this next one. So before that, <laughs> I was famous in Juno for being the only candidate to lose the same election twice. Yeah, I thought so. So, uh, I'm Momol Dude, I'm 38. I, I've been in Juno since 96. I'm a data processor for the state. Uh, I'm also a fellow for the United America uh, Alaska Research Council, and we're studying uh, voting trends, voting data. I contribute Alaska data to Harvard's voting and election science team. So I do a lot of behind the scenes, really deep dive stuff. Gonna be working with Michelle on some of that, and really interested in that. And um, but I had also ran for school board right when I was 18. I, I was an engaged youth, you know? I think that um, youth are often very passionate, but just don't really know kind of where to direct that energy, and I was definitely one of those. And I didn't know anything about campaigning or how it worked. I didn't have a manager. I think we bought like 10 signs. Uh, I came in uh, second to last place, and the person that took last didn't even, they dropped out. So. <laughs> Uh, that was tough, losing is tough, um, but the good news is it gets easier. So uh, it took me about 10 years to, to get over that first one. So I was about 27 and I was like, I think I got another run in me. And um, went ahead, same thing, didn't have a campaign manager, didn't have much signage, advertising, you know, didn't really know what I was doing. And uh, I lost again, but I got a little closer that time, right? We had three seats and I took fourth and I was like, well, Nobody runs for four. I, you know, I, I know we all have to be diplomatic about that. That's not why people run. And um, so what had happened is somebody had resigned right after that. And so that, uh, in Juno, that means the board appoints the next person. And I thought, well, heck, I'm a shoe in now. And um, unfortunately, Lisa Laurel was a heck of a lot better candidate than me. And <laughs> she swept right in and, and got there. And um, that was tough, too. You know, that's a tough one to think, oh, I was a candidate. And, um, but I think the board made the right choice. I, I learned a lot from Lisa. I, I still learn a lot from Lisa. And um, it still took me another 10 years to get over it, right? <laughs> and um, this last fall, I, I, I really wasn't going to go in that direction. And um, I had moved on in, in other places. So I'm obviously with the parks and the pools, Disability Law Center. And uh, part of it was getting experience, but um, part of it is, is also the engagement factor that like I, I believe in the system. I, I'm an institutionalist. I really do believe in it, but I don't think it's perfect. And I think that a lot of what Michelle was saying is you got to get involved to complain, right? And I love to complain about that stuff. And so I'm actually, one of the worst things about being elected is I have to complain a little less to city officials now because it's like I have to maintain relationships. So um, yeah, so I, I, I kept getting involved and um, I've enjoyed it, you know, I really, really do. You, you get to meet people that uh, aren't your friends and they're not your family, but you're passionate about the same things even though you may not agree on everything. And I get a lot from that, you know, the, the work isn't easy, but it, it is valid and, and it's worthwhile. You know, I, I think I probably sometimes get more out of it than, than I put into it. And um, so I, yeah, I'm mostly interested here to just talk about my view on that, on what engagement I think looks like, and you know, uh, a lot of people, I get a lot of calls around election periods for not only engagements like this, but also one-on-one -on -one stuff, or people have questions about their ballots. Um, I think everyone here is gonna vote on November 8th, so I'm really excited about that, and um, some of you will probably text or call me the next morning and say, hey, well, I voted, and it didn't solve all the world's problems, so now what's next, right? Where, where do we go from there, and, and how do I, get us there. And my read on that is that it's just, there's no secret, you know, like I'm not, I, I don't own fancy suits, you know, <laughs> like I'm not a lobbyist, so I, I, and I found that you don't really need to forfeit too much of who you are. I think you should just really know who you are, trust who you are, know your truth, and follow them. That'll help you out. And um, 
Another thing that I found has been a real strength um, in helping me through these last 10, 20 years is um, be general in your goals. You know, it's, it's very tricky if you set out to say, oh, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna open a park in my neighborhood, right? That's, that's great and that's admirable, but then when you get there, then what, right? You know, or if you run, if your goal is to get elected and you win or you lose, then what? You know, you gotta really, so I, I try to be very general in my goals. My goal when I ran last year was, I thought that the current board we had was good and that they were doing mostly good work, but that I, I could probably be an addition and, and add some value there. And that's easy, that carries me through the hard days. And um, I follow that general goal setting with very specific action. So I think that it's good to have general goals but be specific in what you're gonna do to, to make those two tie together. And, um, you know, I, I had a, a meet with KQOO the other week, and um, it's weird, it's, it's kind of like this event, it's weird to, to be invited to engagements and be like, yeah, I've been a loser for 20 years, and <laughs> that opens doors for me now, you know? It, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to, to be comfortable and vulnerable in a public setting about being a loser for two decades, right? That's just, most people wouldn't answer that phone call, right? You know, you're not like, oh, I don't wanna go talk about the, those two decades, right? <laughs> so, um, but it, I think we also need to be deliberate in what we define as a loss, in what we define as success, in what we define as engagement, because you do not need to run for office to be engaged. You know, there are plenty of ways to get involved in civics. CBJ right now has dozens of vacancies on the boards, and we have some of our assembly members here, and they've informed me I can't be on any more boards for the city. Like they're like, <laughs> we tried one more, and it didn't work out. I had to resign. So um, I, I would encourage folks to do that. Um, don't think that you need to be an expert on Robert's rules or the super user of that group. You, you just need to have a couple of hours a month and willing to meet with neighbors and community members. And um, I think we also need to define what success is, right? Because success in those areas, like winning an election, that's a pretty clear indicator of success for the time being, right? I've got a few years to figure out if I'm gonna be successful again. And statistically, probably not, right? Like my trend is, well, we'll see how it goes. But um, yeah, just being gracious with yourself and your community about what is that, what is engaging, what is civics, and what is a loss. And losses are okay because Winning is what gets you in the door, for sure. But losing is what makes you better, you know? That you can say, oh man, that was the worst loss ever. And like my first one, I really did. Like I, I was nauseous, you know? It, it was a tough one, you're, it was pre-COVID, so everyone would go to DZ for the school board race, so you're there with like as many people that voted, you know? And uh, so it's, it, it was tough, but those losses, they, they inform you, and you, you, you tend to learn a lot predominantly what not to do next time. You know, that's usually like, all right, that didn't work. Um, but it also, it depends on why you're running. So if you're running just for the name recognition, both winning and losing will get you there, right? Like I was known as the only guy that lost twice, so. Um, but if your goal is to advocate for you and your family and your community and to stand up for your values, losing is, is a win in, in a lot of ways for that where if you stand up and you be yourself and you speak your truth, even if you come up short, that's starting discussions and it's getting your name out there and it's networking. And um, you know, last year, I I had 25 people call me the day before I registered to run uh, to encourage me. I had no interest at that point. And the first two, you're polite, like, oh, yeah, that's that's nice. Uh, 25, you're like, I probably gotta do something. I gotta call my family, you know, and see what see where that they are with that, and I think those calls happened because I was known as somebody that was already engaged in the process, and, and the community felt we needed a third person to run outside of the current slate, and so that is, you know, I, I, I'm i okay with losing, like I really am, like if I, if I lose re-election, that's okay, it doesn't mean that the town doesn't like me, you know, the first time I thought that, and the second <laughs> time I thought that maybe a little less, but, um, it doesn't mean that. It just, it just means it's not your time for that specific thing, and that's okay. No one is saying that your ideas are not valid or that you are not valid. It is, hey, maybe try something else, right? Or go do something else in the interim. And, then, and that's really what I did is, so when I lost my first school board race, uh, we were having issues with some of our park management and, and the public use of 
And I was interested and I was passionate on that. And it turns out you can't lose election to the Parks Advisory Committee. Uh, it's an appointed board. It did take me four tries to get on that one. So like, I promise you when I say I'm a loser, it is like, I will die in the wall. And um, so uh, I did parks for a while. I eventually became the vice chair, which I still am to this day. And um, part of that duty is we all are liaisons to specific departments. And so I saw that aquatics had a need. They were, they were in a state of change. So I became their liaison. I, I, I don't swim in the pools every day, I'll be honest or even weekly, but um, I, was, I, was, I believed in that. And so I was their liaison, and now I'm also their board chair and their finance chair. And then you need more people to do that, you know? And so like when I was asked to apply to the Disability Law Center, it's a statewide board, and they're the protection advocacy agency for the entire state. And um, they reached out to me, you know, and that's an honor, and, and, and that doesn't, that, that's because I'm good at losing, right? And I, I, you get graceful at it, you know, and you, and you get better at it. And um, you'll find that it's scary and it's tough. And I know that most people do not like public speaking, myself included. But what I've found is, is you're not alone. Like, I, I'm the only one speaking right now, but I'm not alone here, you know? And we probably don't agree on every specific thing 100%. But we all do agree that we're up here for the right reason and to get folks engaged. And all of the boards and the committees and, and the work that I've done with nonprofits, um, I find that to be true. You know, it's I think it's a pretty hard sell. And it, it would take a pretty stubborn person to not believe in something and not be passionate about something, but still go to the meetings for five hours a week. Like that would be, you know, I, I'm not capable of that. And so um, what's nice about Juno is and we're coming down a little bit, but we have about one board for every 1,000 citizens in our community. And so you don't have to be on aquatics or parks, you know, any of that. We, we've got something for everybody. Um, and in that pendulum swings. Sometimes there's too many applicants for a position. And so it takes you four tries to be on parks. Other times, we have nobody. We don't have enough people. And, and that's kind of where we are right now, is we do not have enough people. And so, it would probably be pretty easy for you to just apply. You can go to juno.org. There's a tab for boards and commissions. And um, even if those don't work for you, that's okay too. You know, sometimes that's too formal for folks. But um, you can complain like that. That's like as an elected official, I, that's part of my job, and, and we get a lot of that. Um, but what I would say about getting involved and in, in engaging the system is that. It teaches you how to complain. You learn you have, who, to, who to complain to, right? Sometimes the person taking the call is not the right one. And also how to phrase it, right? So like when I first started, I didn't know Robert's rules. I was not an expert on any of that. And now I'm the secretary for a couple of organizations and help them out in the, in the parliamentary fashion. So um, I didn't go to college for any of this. I don't even have an associate's degree. And like I'm the only one without a PhD on the research council. And it's because People just kept pushing me and nudging me in the right direction, and it, it, it definitely takes a community. So, um, like if we're looking specific towards the youth engagement, right? I, I think that it's great that Kyle's here, and we want a room full of Kyle's, right? I think the reality is that that's not gonna happen. I wasn't sure if you were. I think that all of us here, we're here because we at least want to be engaged at some level and see what we can do to increase that. And so I think that it's kind of the hub and spoke system like we have in Alaska. I think engagement works the same way, where one person is super engaged, our Kyle, he reaches out to five friends, they reach out, and I think that that also works with, um, it's a two-way street. So um, Michelle was speaking on how in, in Bethel about 20% were, were discarded, right? So one of the ways to kind of counteract that is to vote early, right? And so, for example, this cycle, I messed up my ballot. I voted early and I messed it up. So I just took it with me to my polling center. You know, I was like, hey, I think I messed this up. And I was like, yeah, you did. And so um, we can be that for each other, you know, and we can be that for others. And don't be scared to let those communications come the other way too. Like if you guys have a question, that's fine. Like I'm a pretty easy guy to get a hold of and, and I love this stuff. Like it's, it's weird to love like getting up here and public speaking about you know, how long it takes you to just get to that little spot, but it's, it's important. And I, I think we all are here because we know that it is. And I think that um, part of that and part of being in a community is those two-way communications. And so um, 
I'm thankful that you guys are all here, and I would just ask that we just do a little bit of work, and then if those people say no, you know, that, that happens, we're not gonna win them all, but, but just keep at it, and if they, they don't have questions, and you can't answer them, but we all like to do that, you know, that's why we're here, and so um, I would definitely encourage you guys to get out there and, and get on some boards and some commissions, lose some elections, but most of all, know yourself, know your truth, and, and just follow that, I, I, like, because I, I don't think you can ever lose it that, right? Like, I'm still me, you know, so it's like, that's a good value. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a definitely a great it's value. It's resilience, right? It, you know. Yeah, and I think that's re what's really true when you see politicians, those that can actually really speak to their truths. I, 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 I'm reflecting too about something that Bruce said earlier when he said, um, you know, don't just be, don't just complain. You actually have to be at the table. Um, and, and I've always kind of looked at that with whatever organization or wherever I've been. I've kind of always thought. You know, if I'm going to, if I have a problem, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to, and if I don't want to do, don't want to do something about it, then I should just keep my mouth shut. And, um, and I think that's what it comes down to elections. I vote because I care about what the issues are and I'm informed about the issues. And I think that's what each one of you guys brought here today. I was so excited to hear each one of your presentations because I know a little bit of your history, but I also, um, you know, how much that you have made a difference to Alaska by the work that you are doing and contributing. And I just think that that's just so important. Um, I'm excited about the election changes. Um, I was, you know, worked at NCAI for many years. In fact, I realized that I started this whole thing and didn't even introduce myself um, because I was so excited about the topic. <laughs> So, kusin yo hatu asal, suka adi ayat kaguantan yadi yehita. But um, so Jackie Peta and I was in Washington D.C. and I was there running Native Vote across the country um, and helping to make that happen. But I was also there in the courts when we went to challenge the states who are not living up to their word and their requirements to make sure that we had ballots and interpreters and we had polls that were posted and the barge didn't leave before the votes got finished and things like that. So we had, um, you know, those are important things to have these, these always evaluating where we're at and always then looking at the data and statistics because I agree that learning and understanding who voted um, makes a big difference to find out who didn't vote and why they didn't vote. Southeast Alaska can make a huge difference. Alaska Natives can make a huge difference in our elections, only if we're counted. Um, so I also want to remind folks that we are going to have another forum um, coming up on Native Vote, which we're going to get in more into the specifics about the Constitution Amendment and a few of those other kinds of things. So don't forget about that. Um, is there any questions online? OK, no questions online. And we have a few moments to take some questions here, and definitely we can have closing comments from each of you. I, I was wondering if you guys wanted to play. It's almost a four-minute video. Oh, yeah. Um, we were going to do that. Yeah. Let's do that. We're, we're definitely going to do that. And while he's gearing up, I just want to also say I want to recognize Jamie Gomez, who's here, because at NCAI, National Congress of American Indians, she was the one who actually did the work behind the scenes to get Native Vote going across the country. So I want to thank her for her contributions. Ranked choice voting allows the candidate with the strongest overall support to win and reduces the need for runoff elections. Here's how it works. Pretend you're deciding what to eat for dinner and you have four options. Instead of voting for just one, you rank all four with the one you want most at number one. It's important to rank all four because if your number one choice doesn't win, you still get to have a voice in who the next choice will be. Let's say you want salmon, so you rank it number one. But if you can't have salmon, you'll take berries. And if berries aren't available, you'll eat herring eggs. And in last place, muktuk. Everyone else ranks their four options. Now let's count everyone's votes. With ranked choice, a winner must get the majority of all votes more than 50%. Salmon is ahead, but only has seven votes. It needs at least 11 to win. 
Berries and Herring Eggs both received five votes. Muktuk got three. Since none has a majority, we eliminate the one in last place. Sorry, Muktuk fans. We're going to count your second choice. Two for Berries and one for Herring Eggs. But none has gotten 11 votes. So we do not have a choice that the majority of people agree on yet. Let's eliminate the one now in last place. See ya, Herring Eggs. So, the people who voted for Muktuk and the people who voted Herring Eggs did not get their favorite choice. But they still get to have their voices heard because we're going to count their second choice. And we have a winner. Even though more people voted for Salmon as their number one choice, Berries got the most total votes, which means more people overall voted for Berries. And that's how ranked choice voting works. Chinan. It was actually easier to describe ranked choice voting with how it fell out with uh, Al Gross dropping out uh, in the August special election. Politics is tearing us apart. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, too. <laughs> in the US. Did not but for three, for three, uh, three people running uh, on the on the special election ballot that you saw in August, um, you again, Bruce brought this up earlier. Rank choice voting does not require you to rank. You do not have to rank if you don't want to. A lot of people couldn't bring themselves to mark a second oval or a third oval. It's it's up to you. You can choose. You can treat it like a primary if you want to. Be your one and done, and call it good. But if your one choice, your top choice, was the least vote getter, they were knocked out immediately if, if anyone didn't get that 51% right out of the gate. So you were knocked out, and the two remaining candidates are in an instant runoff. If you didn't rank a second person, you did not participate at all in that instant runoff. So again, it was easier to suggest to people I, I, I can understand and appreciate if you just want to vote for your one favorite person, but if there's going to be an instant runoff be, be, between the other two, who would you rather have serve, serve out a term? And, and a lot of light bulbs went off for, mm -hmm. for people like that. Now, in a lot of these races, U.S. Senate, U.S. House, Governor and Lieutenant Governor, your State House or your State Senate, you have up to five, Five people if you do a write-in candidate, too. They have to be a registered right. write-in candidate in order to be counted. But you have up to five choices in each office if you wanted to. And you can rank them in the order that you want. So not every, not every office has more than one candidate or two candidates. You know, it varies per, per district. But that's what you're gonna see. And, and on the Division of Elections website, or I'm going to get on the Native Vote on Facebook, or our aknativevote.org uh, uh, website, we will show you where you, you can find your sample ballots. And it's good to look through it and get familiar with it and practice with it. So that you can, you can walk into the polling station and fill out your ballot with confidence and, and make less mistakes and then, and then you have you have participated in a new. She's got sample ballots back there, yeah. so you can. We just want you to be able to vote with confidence. Again, you can just vote for one and be done. That's up to you. But the, in time, after this learning curve, we're going to get more comfortable and confident with ranked choice voting, and we can start voting strategically, eventually. And and we're all going to get really, really good at this. Um, but for now, you know, this is a learning curve and, and we hope that you guys give it a chance. Great. If I could just add real briefly, the, sure. the, the other issue with the bullet voting, yeah. like if you just do the one and done, is that the, the vote to win, the math problem that we get to the 50% plus one vote, is of remaining ballots. So if you, if you exhaust your ballot, like you just do the one and then it's out, not only are, is your voice not being included into that set, but it's now easier for every remaining candidate to get to that BPW number. And so there is that bit of strategy that you have to think of where we generally have one, right? Where like, I like people who either vote for somebody or usually against somebody, right? Those are the two. And so there is you know, th that consideration there on that second level. 
Ricardo. Yes, uh, thank you guys for your presentation. And thank you for stating that um, we're still learning and becoming comfortable with the ranked choice. It really is difficult, particularly in this election. I'm thinking about the, the video example that you just used. And, and, you know, we may have salmon as our top choice, but what if instead of berries and herring eggs and muktuk, we have Brussels sprouts and snake and uh, beets or something like that? Then it's, you know, People are like, well, I only want to vote for one. I, I don't want to vote for Brussels sprouts or snakes. Um, <laughs> so that's where it becomes important when you talk about strategy and thinking about, okay, what do I want to eat the you know, least or more than the worst one? Um, but, uh, you know, and that's, that's really complicated, I think, to, to get there. But I think once we become more comfortable um, or, or understand the process that may make more sense to us or be easier to, to uh, use. Okay. Yeah, you're right. I think um, especially the outcomes of this election is really going to make a difference. People will really understand, you know, how did they vote and how did it compare to what the outcomes are. I would just add my own two bits here. Because um, I've talked with a lot of people, friends who are complete turmoil trying to figure out um, the strategy of how to rank. And I guess I've come to the conclusion you should vote your heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if that leads you to deciding you're going to bullet vote or that you're just going to vote for two, Thank you. you have to live with yourself. And uh, I, I think trying to gain that, uh, we've had many experiences in Alaska's past under the old system, where people were willing to briefly switch parties in order to try and vote the weakest candidate of the other party. Um, those efforts usually backfired. And uh, so uh, I guess my personal view, it's not the official view of uh, the organization the day, but it's to say, vote your, vote your heart. Um, you'll be able to sleep at night. That's okay, well, it's that time where we're going to do the door prizes, and I know that's always an important part for any event. Um, and before we do that, I, I want to again thank our panelists here today, um, and I also want to thank um, Central Council for allowing us to have it in this facility and providing us snacks, <laughs> dinner for most of us. Um, so I want to thank all, um, all of the people who work, and particularly those that are working as part of the Native Vote Coalition to work in Southeast Alaska and in all of Alaska to make differences for our communities. So they, each of you, if you could help me out. See, this is the one thing politicians hate to do because they know that they pick one person and that person will love them. I'm not picking a lot. Yeah, that's what I was like. This is. But at least I get to share the board. Okay. And you pick one, it's in the numbers, so we have to read out the numbers. Yes. Yeah. You want us to read out the numbers? Or um, do you trust me? I trust you. <laughs> I'm a politician, so yeah. I'm worried about that. 204. Seven nine, and here are the crucial numbers. Three nine, and that is for a fifth. Um, let me get to my mic. Uh, did you hear the number? Anybody? That's for a fifty dollar SHI gift card. So the last digits of that number is what? We're going to call it again. Nine three nine. Nine three nine. Well, I know I have it, but I'm not sure. Oh, you have it. Nine three nine. Okay, last three. All right. Okay. Right, and the second? We've got 912. 912? Anybody have that ticket for a $100 SHI gift card? Whoa, right there in the back. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't know I had to do the big prize. Now I'm even more nervous. <laughs> Nine four three. Nine four three. Right there in the back. Nine four three. A Sea Alaska sweatshirt. 
So do, are you getting those for me? Yeah. Okay. And I'll pull this one here, and I'm stirring up the pot, and I am got 914. Anybody for 914 and a $100 Costco gift card? 914, you have to be present to win. No takers? All right. I have a question. Yes. Can I win twice on one ticket? <laughs> no, no, I don't think that works with the same ticket. <laughs> okay, I'll pull another number. Okay. 931. 931. All right. $100 Costco gift card. Okay, who's the youngest person attending tonight? Okay, let's go, let's go to age here. Who's the youngest person? Okay, is there someone younger than Rico? <laughs> Connor, how old are you? <laughs> 24. Anybody younger than 24? You are not younger than 24, Mr. President. <laughs> huh? Oh, there's a young girl in the, underneath the table? She is definitely the youngest. You win. Yay. Thank you for coming. She's going to be our future voter. And the last gift card is 936. 936? Hade? Yadu Hut? Okay, and now we have online um, gifts. Um, so I'm, there's two uh, random winners. Um, and for our Facebook viewers, we have Conrad Mueller. You get us a, a $50 gift certificate to SHI. And Ernestine Jack, a $100 SHI gift card. Congratulations to our online viewers. Once again, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Um, and it was just kind of fun to be together and have this conversation. I'm very energized about the next forum so that we can learn and be a little bit prepared, more prepared for Native Vote. Thank you, Mr. President, for coming. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you to our panelists. Goodness, Chish. <laughs>